program manager. I'm a program manager in the Housing and Tenant Protections Division here at the Los Angeles County Department of Consumer and Business Affairs. Uh, we also go by the acronym DCBA. And today we'll be sharing an update on the tenant protections in the county. Um, we will be talking about uh, current protections that are in place, as well as protections that will be expiring at the end of this month on March 31st. And then we'll talk about protections that will be continuing uh, beginning April 1st through uh, the rest of the year. Um, and with that, uh, Mary, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes, hi everyone. My name is Mary Safarian um, and along with Scott, um, I oversee the counseling and intake team uh, for Housing and Tenant Protections Division. Uh, we thank everybody for joining us today and we hope um, today's session is helpful um, to, to all of you. Uh, we will get um, the, the presentation um, shared out um, shortly um, and then we'll get started. Thank you. Okay, give me just one second here. Okay, so um, a little preview of what we're gonna cover today. Uh, I'd like to give a brief introduction about the Housing and Tenant Protections Division and what's under our purview and an update on the status of the county's emergency tenant protections and then share what permanent tenant protections currently exist in the county. Uh, we will also discuss the upcoming expiration of the emergency tenant protections that have been in place during COVID and discuss the current and proposed financial assistance programs designed to support our county rental property owners and landlords. Um, and Mike, I'm sorry, can we um, skip to um... Uh, skip a couple slides. Um, yeah, we can go to slide three. And then we'll hit next slide so you can move on to the following one. Okay, so a little about the housing and tenant protections team that we have here at DCBA. Uh, we have worked in the landlord tenant area for a number of years, uh, but the team was formally uh, put together in 2018 to implement uh, board initiatives aimed to protect vulnerable tenants in unincorporated Los Angeles County. Uh, this division, it oversees and enforces the county's two rent stabilization ordinances, uh, one for brick and mortar rental units in unincorporated LA County, and the other ordinance applies to the space rent uh, that's paid uh, by mobile home uh, owners in mobile home parks. Uh, we also support the Rental Housing Oversight Commission. Uh, we also refer to it as the ROC. And this is the commission that serves as the appellate body for our staff level decisions. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, our division had to pivot to implement the Emergency County COVID-19 Tenant Protections Resolution, which was also known as the eviction moratorium. Uh, this unit, we also oversee and administer the Stay Housed LA County program. Uh, this is the county's eviction defense program uh, that assists folks that need legal assistance uh, as they go through the eviction process. We could go to slide four, please. Next, I'd like to provide an update on the status of the county's COVID-19 tenant protections. Um, we'd like to recognize that these protections have evolved over time and have given all of the jurisdictions in the county, as well as federal and state level protections that were implemented during the pandemic. 
Uh, we know that this is confusing, but our goal here is to pro provide you with a high level overview of what's in place for the county. Uh, we want to note that these protections will expire at the end of this month as they were tied to the locally declared emergency. Uh, however, there are a few protections in the emergency or the COVID-19 tenant protections resolution that will extend beyond March 31st, 2023. Uh, can we go to slide five, please? So what is the county's COVID-19 tenant protections? We also refer to it as the resolution. Uh, it went into effect at the beginning of COVID. Uh, on March 4th, 2020, and it did extend through the end of this month, March 31st, 2023. What this resolution did or what these protections did was place a countywide ban on most evictions for residential uh, tenants who had been impacted by COVID-19. This also applied to mobile home space renters. Uh, there were some protections for commercial tenants as well. Uh, those protections expired earlier this year, um, but we did wanna mention that the resolution did provide protections to commercial tenants during the effective period. The county's tenant protections resolution also applies to the incorporated cities within the county. Uh, the county's made up of 88 incorporated cities Anything outside of those incorporated cities are considered unincorporated LA County. So the county, uh, this resolution was broadly applied to not only apply to unincorporated LA County, but also to the 88 incorporated cities within the county to ensure that there was a baseline of uh, level protections for those residents, unless their own incorporated city had stronger protections in place through their own eviction moratorium. There were a lot of cities, uh, including city of LA, uh, that did have their own protections in place, um, but the counties uh, applied and applies to any of those cities that did not have protections in place. Uh, next slide, please. Now, while these tenant protections are set to expire at the end of this month. Uh, we do wanna take a moment to just discuss what's currently in place through the end of this month. Right now, residential tenants and mobile home space renters uh, do have protections against evictions due to non-payment of rent. If a tenant was financially affected by COVID during the period from July 1, 2022, through March 31st, 2023. Uh, tenants who are, are low income and, and income qualified were required to provide a notice to their landlords within seven days of their rent being due, letting the landlord know that the tenant had been financially impacted by COVID and therefore uh, they were unable to pay their rent or pay their full rent. It's important to note that the county's resolution was never meant to be a cancellation of rent. Rent has always been due. Um, so tenants still must pay any back rent uh, that is unpaid uh, during these protections that were in place. Uh, other um, protections under the resolution, there are uh, protections against no fault evictions, except for qualified owner move-ins. What this means is that a tenant can't just be evicted because a landlord wants the tenant out. It means there has to be a reason for the eviction, okay? Um, other protections under the resolution, uh, there are protections for tenants who are causing nuisances. There are also protections for unauthorized occupants or pets who began residing in rental units between the period of March 1, 2020 and January 20, 2023. Uh, next slide, please. Um, and Mike, I'm sorry, we can stay on the previous slide. The slides are actually ahead of, uh, yeah, thank you. 
Oh, okay, thank you. So what protections survive after the resolution expires at the end of this month? Uh, for tenants who utilize the county's non-payment of rent protections between the period July 2022 and March 31, 2023, they will still be protected against eviction for no fault eviction reasons, except as mentioned earlier for qualified owner move-ins. Uh, there are still anti-harassment and retaliation protections in place for tenants uh, during the resolutions protection period. Uh, beginning April 1, 2023, Landlords are required to serve tenants with a written 30-day notice prior to filing an eviction or an unlawful detainer based on non-payment of rent for rent accrued during, for back rent accrued during the protected period. Uh, for tenants who have unauthorized occupants or pets in their units who began residing in the unit between March 2020 and January 2020. Three, there are also protections in place beginning April 1, 2023. Landlords are required to serve tenants with a written 30 day notice prior to filing an unlawful detainer or eviction based on the presence of unauthorized occupants or pets. Next slide, please. As mentioned previously, emergency protections are set to expire at the end of this month. On February 28th, 2023, the Los Angeles County Board of Supervisors voted to end the local emergency declared on COVID-19. And it's also uh, the marking of the end of the county's tenant protections resolution, which again will be expiring on March 31st, 2023. Next slide, please. While we discuss the protections that survive after the resolution expires, we do wanna take a minute to highlight what exactly the expiration of these tenant protections means. Uh, most evictions for residential tenants and mobile home space renters may resume as normal, except for no fault evictions for tenants who exercise their rights under the county's non-payment of rent protections. Uh, tenants must resume making rent payments as normal to avoid being evicted. As of April 1st, 2023, there will no longer be a non-payment of rent protection in place for tenants. They must pay their rent as of April 1st, or they can be evicted for non-payment of rent. Tenants who utilize the county's non-payment of rent protections will still have 12 months to repay the past due rent. Uh, just to give you an example of how that works is if you have a tenant that was unable to pay their rent in July 2022, their 12-month repayment period would be, begin the month after they were unable to pay that July rent. So beginning August 1, 2022, they would have 12 months in which to repay that back rent that is owed for July, 2022, okay? Uh, if a tenant was unable to pay for August, uh, again, the repayment period would start the month after the tenant is unable to pay the rent. So given this example of August non-payment of rent, 2022, then the repayment period for 12 months would begin starting on September, 2022 and going forward for 12 months. Rent increases may also be issued for rent stabilized units and mobile home spaces located in unincorporated LA County in accordance with the county's rent stabilization ordinances. Uh, there is a 3% cap for 2023 calendar year, uh, and that 3% um, will be in effect come April 1. There is an additional uh, component on the rent cap for luxury units. Uh, they are capped at a 5% uh, rent cap. 
And while these emergency protections are expiring, there are still permanent tenant protections in place for unincorporated LA County and incorporated city, cities. It's important to verify the jurisdiction of the property to ensure that you are up to date with any permanent protections that may apply to your rental property. So if you have a rental property and it's not located in one of the 88 incorporated cities and it's located in unincorporated LA County, then the rental property is at, at a minimum partially covered by the county's tenant, uh, by the county's uh, rent stabilization ordinance, sorry. Um, and then uh, depending on certain conditions, a property can be fully covered under the county's rent stabilization ordinance, uh, depending on the year the property was built and depending on if there are two or more units on a lot. Uh, next slide, please. While the Board of Supervisors uh, did take action to enact much needed emergency tenant protections during a critical time as we went through the pandemic, uh, we do understand the impacts that these protections have had on property owners who have also faced issues during the pandemic. Uh, during the next couple of slides, we'll be discussing current and proposed financial assistance programs designed to support our county rental property owners. Next slide, please. But before going into the final uh, financial assistance programs, we'd just like to share information on the services provided by another program at DCBA, and this is our foreclosure prevention unit. Landlords who are experiencing financial difficulty due to COVID may benefit from services provided through the foreclosure prevention program. If a property owner or landlord has uh, become delinquent uh, with their mortgage or in default on their mortgage, uh, we have a team of counselors who can provide options counseling along with appropriate referrals and resources um, as well as to potentially mediate uh, mortgages and liens with lien holders. And these folks also help provide vital resources and assistance to homeowners who are faced with foreclosure. And we will be sharing out contact information for this program at the end of the presentation. Uh, now going on to the financial assistance programs um, that uh, the County Board of Supervisors has uh, considered, we will be launching round two of the mortgage relief program for property owners who have experienced financial hardship. Uh, this program may offer relief of up to $30,000 Further details and updates on this program will be emailed out to the folks on our list serve and that information will all also be posted to our website. Um, keep in mind that these programs are still being stood up and being developed and as soon as we know more details, we can share that information out to everyone and you can see that on our website as soon as that becomes available. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, there will also be what's called a mom and pop landlord assistance program. Uh, there's been approximately $3 million set aside by the county to assist mom and pop landlords. Uh, and this is non-mortgage uh, related relief. This is being designed as a complement to the mortgage relief partnership that I just discussed. Uh, this program will assist distressed mom and pop landlords who have been financially affected by the pandemic and have been unable to collect the rent uh, throughout the pandemic. Under this recommended framework, landlords could potentially receive up to $30,000 in direct financial assistance to cover qualifying non-mortgage related expenses uh, that relate to the preservation, maintenance, and upkeep of 
their rental properties. And while we don't mention it on this slide, DCBA is also working on launching a rent relief program that would prioritize assistance to properties owned by mom and pop landlords and low income tenants. Uh, we are still working on the development and implementation of this program and a report back was filed with the County Board of Supervisors containing recommended uh, guidelines and framework for what this program would look like. We will again be posting any updates uh, as they become available and as uh, they're finalized. Uh, one other service that I wanted to mention that's offered through our department is our mediation services, also referred to as our dispute resolution program. Uh, this is uh, available to folks, uh, both landlords and tenants, um, with support through a neutral third party. They try and resolve disputes outside of court without having to go through, say, the eviction process. Uh, if a landlord and tenant are willing to participate uh, in this voluntary and confidential um, program, then potentially they could work out a deal uh, where they can resolve the dispute and uh, not have to go to court. But if mediation does not work out, then of course, um, court would be uh, the other option if they're not able to resolve the dispute. Uh, next slide, please. And before we jump into the question and answer session, um, I would like to provide our contact information for the department. Uh, while I am presenting on behalf of the Housing and Tenant Protections Division, I did mention a couple of the other programs that are offered through our department. Um, all programs can be reached by dialing our main phone number, which is an 800 number. It's 1-800-593-8222, or you can visit DCBA's website directly at dcba.lacounty.gov. Uh, I've also provided some additional contact information for our program. Uh, in the Housing and Tenant Protections Division, as well as the Foreclosure Prevention Team. Um, and to remain updated on relevant information from our department, such as program launches like the rental assistance that I mentioned earlier, we encourage folks to go ahead and sign up for email notifications uh, by visiting our department's website. You can sign up uh, directly online, and uh, that way you'll find out about things uh, as they happen. Um, next slide, please. Okay, I know I kind of went through things uh, pretty quickly here, but as I wrap up the presentation, we are going to open it up for a question and answer session. So I'd just like to take the opportunity to thank everyone for their time today for joining our webinar. Uh, we hope this information is helpful in understanding what's going on with the current uh, protections and with the upcoming changes that will be happening uh, beginning April 1. Um, hi, uh, Mary Safarian again. Um, I do see um, Q&As um, coming in, so I'll take a moment to go through um, and respond to um, some of the questions. Um, the session is recorded and it will be shared out. Um, the recording of uh, this webinar will also be posted to our website, so please be sure to visit our website after the presentation um, for a copy of the slides and also the recording. Um, uh, so keep an eye out, please. We should be able to post that at the uh, very latest by tomorrow. We did, some, uh, we did get some questions with reference to um, terminating a tenancy for landlord move-in. Um, while there's currently restrictions in place as it relates to um, COVID-19 emergency tenant protections, um, landlords are able, uh, may be able to terminate for um, qualified um, landlord move-in. Uh, we do have the requirements um, indicated on our website, along with the required disclosures and forms um, that would need to be completed um, while these protections are, uh, while emergency tenant protections are expiring at the end of this month. 
um, there are um, some restrictions that will remain in place as it relates to no fault um, protections, as Scott mentioned. Um, so please uh, visit our website for more information. If there's any specific situation that you would like to talk through with our office, please give us a call at 800-593-8222. Um, it is also important to note that um, most jurisdictions, um, unincorporated LA County, along with um, some city incorporated cities, um, do have their own permanent protections in place. Um, so um, feel free to contact our office or check with your local city for more information on whether or not there's any permanent protection that may be applicable to your rental property. Um, I'm just gonna go ahead and go through the questions. Um, we have a question from Joseph. Can I enter my rental unit and install new solar panels this March? Um, there is no prohibition on entry um, to the property by landlord, um, as long as you are following the state's requirements, uh, which is um, in uh, which can be found in Civil Code 1954. Um, so just be sure to refer to that code section for um, additional guidance on entry by landlord. Um, we have questions about non-payment of rent um, and what that looks like um, as far as the repayment period. Um, I'm going to go ahead and pass that over to my colleague, Michelle, uh, for a response um, to ge generally respond on what repayment looks like um, as far as the resolution is concerned. Sorry, I'm, I'm battling a cold scar. Are you able to take that in case Michelle is un, uh, unable to unmute? Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, I'm sorry, what, what was the question we were looking at? Um, can we address non-payment of rent and what that looks like um, as far as our resolution um, in terms of the repayment period? Right, so um, as we discussed during the presentation, um, there would be a 12 month period uh, starting the month after the tenant cannot pay their rent. So I gave the example of uh, a tenant who could not pay in August, or I'm sorry, in July, 2022. Um, they would have from August 1, 2022 until July 31st, 2023, uh, to repay that back rent that's owed for that month of July. And then it rolls forward after that. So it's, it's a 12 month period beginning the month after the tenant cannot pay the rent for that particular month. Uh, thank you. Um, we are getting questions on what happens um, as of April 1st as it relates to non-payment of rent protections. Um, as Scott noted, those protections will no longer be in place. Uh, so tenants would be required um, to repay rent um, uh, as, as normal um, as of April 1st, 2023 um, to um, avoid being evicted. Um, for the, uh, the resolution protected pe protections period, um, along with any um, uh, other protections that were in place, um, for example, the city and state, it's important that landlords um, follow those guidances um, in terms of um, terminating a tenancy uh, for those um, uh, protections periods. Okay, I'm um, just going through. Um, we have a question about terminating a tenancy for the sale of a property. Um, there is no prohibition on selling the home. Um, properties are still be um, are are still able to be sold while a tenant resides in the unit. Um, I do understand that um, we do oftentimes get feedback um, that um, new buyers are not interested in purchasing properties uh, with tenants. Um, in the unit, um, but there is currently no prohibition on sale of property. Um, and again, just reiterating, we will be sending over a copy of the slides and we'll also be um, uh, uploading it to our website. Um, I see a question from Ara. Uh, this, this pertains to the city of LA, which is outside of our jurisdiction, but I, I think we can answer this. Uh, she states that she inherited a few condo units from her parents in the city of LA, but not under RSO because condos are considered single family residences, which are typically exempt. 
uh, from RSO. Uh, she mentions that she would like to sell these units as she does not want to be a landlord. Uh, she wants to know if she falls under the city or the county rules. Uh, her tenants have been paying, no issues for collecting rent. They never used any tenant protections rights. So for city of LA, we would want you to contact the Los Angeles Housing Department uh, just to let them know what you're planning on doing um, so that you can be sure that you uh, are in compliance with the city's rules because the city's rules would apply uh, to these condos and the city um, does have what's called just a just cause ordinance uh, that was put into effect recently and it applies to all properties, all rental properties, I should say, in uh, the incorporated city of LA. Uh, so again, um, I would just uh, encourage Ara to go ahead and contact the LA Housing Department directly uh, to find out what their requirements are in order for her to be in compliance with their rules and their just cause ordinance. Um, and we're getting a bit um, of confusion surrounding the new 30 day notice requirements. Um, so I do want to take a moment to address that. Um, if a tenant um, is behind on rent as of April 1st, um, 2023, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Excuse me, sorry, Scott, can you take this question? Yeah. <laughs> There's confusion about the 30-day notice requirements and uh, what's applicable as of April uh, 1st. Yeah, so, so effective April 1st, uh, there's a 30-day notice requirement um, rather than just a three-day notice. Um, so, so that's the difference uh, of what's going into effect come April 1st, it's now a 30 day notice rather than a three day notice if it's a non-payment of rent type situation. Um, and to be clear, as of April 1st, for those tenants who are behind on rent, it would be, um, it would actually be a, um, um, a, a three day notice or um, a, a 10 day notice, depending on the jurisdiction the property falls under. The 30 day notice requirement would be um, based on the non payment of requirement, um, non payment of non payment of rent uh, protections uh, between July 1st, 2022 and March 31st, 2023. So I hope um, that addresses any um, confusion. Um, and then Scott will move on to the next question. Okay. So, yeah, there's a um, there's a question from Carlos. Uh, he says he wants to move into his house after March 31st. Will I be able to do that without penalty or without having to pay the tenants? Um, well, the answer to that um, depends. Um, it depends on where the property is located, what the jurisdiction is, um, because if it's in the jurisdiction of unincorporated LA County, uh, you could potentially move into the house, um, but you would have to pay uh, the tenant's relocation uh, and you would have to meet certain eligibility requirements in order to do that move in. Um, so, but, but the other option would be uh, that rather than paying the, um, paying the relocation, you could negotiate uh, some kind of cash for keys arrangement or a buyout agreement. Um, those are two options that property owners have to negotiate with their tenants uh, if the landlord or the property owner wants to move back into the property. Um, maybe they can offer a lesser dollar amount and a tenant would be agreeable to that. Um, so that's something that could be negotiated. That's something that could go through mediation uh, where you could have a mediated type arrangement uh, and agree the landlord and tenant agree on you know a certain dollar amount in order for the, the tenant to vacate the unit and for the landlord to move in. But otherwise, if the tenant's unwilling to accept a buyout agreement or cash for keys, then uh, the property owner would have to go through uh, the landlord move in process and pay the, relo the full relocation amounts as required by the county. Uh, 
Um, just looking at some other questions here. Yes, uh, we've got a question. Uh, if I want to sell my house, can I evict the tenants? Um, you can sell the house. If there are existing tenants in the property, uh, it's going to depend on where the property is located. Uh, but most likely, uh, in order to evict the tenants, you would have to have a cause. Um, and as we mentioned during the presentation, there are protections for tenants that um, continue on that provide protections against what's called no-fault evictions. So you can't just evict because you want the tenants out to sell the house. But that doesn't mean, again, as I was speaking earlier about, that you cannot negotiate some kind of buyout agreement or cash for keys with the tenants uh, in order to uh, incentivize them to move out of the property so that you can sell the house. So, um, so that's a way you can do it, but you can't do it going through the courts legally uh, because that would be a no fault eviction. Uh, got a question, non RSO single family home, city of LA, um, the property owner wants to withdraw the property from the rental market and perform much needed repairs. How much is the payout that I need to submit? Uh, again, we would refer you over to the LA city housing department because this is their jurisdiction even though it's a non-RSO property, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the city of LA has implemented uh, what's called just cause protections for all rental properties in the city of LA. And this covers non-RSO properties. So all rental properties have some protections in the city of LA. Uh, and those protections would determine um, how you would go about withdrawing the property and still being in compliance with the just cause ordinance that the city has. So I would suggest you contact LA Housing Department and tell them what you're trying to do because you will have to um, go through some steps with them uh, to ensure that you're in compliance. Um, and I'm sorry, we have um, a, a lot of questions coming in, so we'll do our best to, to go through the list of questions. Um, I do want to note that we will be skipping over the very um, case-specific questions. We do ask that you uh, please reach out to our department so that we can be able to address um, that specific situation. Um, I'm also seeing um, questions or clarifying questions coming in regarding rent increases. So as of April 1st, 2023, uh, rent increases uh, may be imposed on properties that are subject um, to the county's rent stabilized ordinances. Um, it's important to note um, that um, you have to verify um, applicability of such protections, whether or not uh, a property is subject to unincorporated um, LA County or other jurisdictions that do also offer um, uh, restrict that do that have also imposed uh, restrictions on rent increases. For example, City of LA has a ban on uh, rent increases, um, I believe, through January um, 2024. Um, so, um, if if you're just unsure, please give our department a call back. Our counselors will work you through will work through identifying jurisdiction and the applicability of any protections related to that situation. Um, and then I'll pass on the next question to Scott. Okay, yeah, we're doing our best to go through the questions. Um, there are quite a few and we won't be able to get to all of them. And some of them are uh, very case specific and we need a lot more background information before we could actually uh, provide a, an accurate response. But let's see what, what we can answer. Um, Okay, somebody asked if our website, if they'll be able to download a copy of the presentation. As we mentioned, yes, this presentation uh, is being recorded and it will be available on our website. Uh, somebody asked about jurisdiction. 
does Long Beach fall under unincorporated cities of LA? As I mentioned earlier, the County of Los Angeles is made up of 88 incorporated cities. Incorporated cities, the largest one being the city of Los Angeles. They have their own city council, they have their own police department, their own fire department. Um, these are cities that, that uh, are incorporated, but there are areas outside of those incorporated cities that don't have those services. And that's the jurisdiction of the county. The county provides services to those areas outside of the incorporated cities. So Long Beach is an incorporated city. Long Beach has its own city council, its own police department, fire department. Uh, and so um, they, they make their own rules there. Um, and so I think that should answer that. If, uh, let's see. Um, while Scott's moving on to the next question, we're getting a lot of um, uh, questions about financial assistance programs. Um, those not necessarily tied, um, a financial assistance needed, um, not necessarily tied to a mortgage. Um, as indicated during the presentation, um, there will be a program coming soon that does provide um, non-mortgage uh, uh, assistance for non-mortgage related um, costs. Um, so please be on the lookout um, for any updates from our office. Um, you can also sign up um, through our uh, department's website to be notified um, of any updates um, on these programs um, that will be launching soon. Um, so please don't hesitate to visit our website and sign up um, to be notified by email or feel free to, to um, give our department a ring and we'll, we'll be happy to address the questions. Okay, um, looking at some other questions that we've received, uh, someone asked, what if a tenant is unable to pay the back rent that's owed during the 12 month repayment period. If a tenant is unable to pay during that period, uh, then a property owner or landlord is going to have to sue that tenant in small claims court in order to get a judgment against that tenant, a, a dollar judgment or a money judgment. Uh, someone asked if there are rent increase restrictions for incorporated cities in LA County, uh, such as El Monte, um, which this person states doesn't currently have any rent increase restrictions. Um, without going into too much detail, um, it, it again depends on the type of property it is, uh, how many units are on a lot, um, and it also has to do with how old the rental property is, uh, because what we didn't talk about, uh, and this is a bigger discussion, but there is a state rent control law that went into effect January 1, 2020. It's called the Tenant Protections Act of 2019. It's also referred to as Assembly Bill 1482. This is a state rent control law that applies to two or more properties located on the same lot that are more than 15 years old. If that is the case, and you're not under any kind of local rent control through your local city, like El Monte in this particular example, then you could be subject to the state rent control law. What the state rent control law does, it has two main components. One is a rent cap, uh, that is based on CPI, that current rent cap is 10%. And the other main component of the state rent control law is that there is just cause protections for tenants uh, who live in properties that are covered under this law, meaning that, again, tenants can't just be evicted because a landlord wants them out and wants to bring in a higher paying tenant. A landlord has to have a cause, a just cause to evict that tenant. So potentially a property in El Monte may not be covered under any local city uh, rent control or rent caps, but potentially a property could be covered under the state rent control law that I just discussed.
And I'm seeing some questions for City of LA. Uh, I would encourage folks to contact the city, the City of LA's housing department for any properties located in the jurisdiction of the City of LA. Uh, again, we're the county and the city has its own set of rules that are separate from what the counties are. Uh, there's a few questions about rent increases in unincorporated LA County. Uh, again, if a property is a fully covered unit, meaning that there is a rent cap, uh, as well as just cause protections in unincorporated LA County, rent increase notices can be given effective April 1, 2023. So just about in a week, uh, those notices can go out to tenants uh, that a rent increase of up to 3% uh, can, be, um, can be put into effect. Uh, someone asked what the eviction process is for non-COVID affected tenants. Uh, that would really depend on the reason for the eviction. Um, typically, uh, if someone is trying to evict a tenant, it has to go through court. It has to go through the unlawful detainer process. If the tenant is unwilling to vacate voluntarily, uh, they're gonna have to be sued. It's filing a lawsuit in court for an unlawful detainer. That's the only legal way to evict a tenant in the state of California. Um, and then um, Mary again, sorry, seeing questions about um, accessing dispute resolution services. <laughs> so to be clear, our department's um, a hotline is, our department's main contact number is 800-593-8222. Uh, you can speak to, uh, you can um, dial that number um, to seek information and assistance on uh, the various programs um, available throughout the department. Um, and then our department's main address, uh, main web address is dcba.lacounty.gov. Um, and then Mike, if we can just go back to um, our, the contact the slide, um, we'll keep that up there um, so that you all can have a moment to gather that information down. Um, and then, sorry, quick time check. Um, the, the presentation will be ending at 11 o'clock. Uh, we do have um, multiple questions um, that we will not be able to get to, um, but please do not hesitate to give our department a call. Um, again, um, the, the telephone number is listed on um, the slide here. Our counselors um, are on standby um, to assist as, as the questions come in. Um, and then one, one um, item to note, if you do not want to uh, remain on queue um, and wait for a counselor, um, you can actually schedule a phone appointment with our department um, and a counselor uh, will dedicate and set time aside to, uh, to connect with you directly during the scheduled time to assist with any questions. Um, again, um, to schedule a phone appointment, you can visit our department's main website um, and then click on the link for a phone appointment. Um, and we will have someone assigned to reach out to you. Um, again, this is for those who don't want to necessarily wait in line for a representative. Yeah, and I, I did see a comment uh, about calling our 800 number. Um, we, we are a very busy department and unit, um, especially with all these uh, changes that have gone into effect or are going into effect. Uh, really over the last three years during COVID, we, we've just had an unprecedented demand for our services here at the county and at Consumer and Business Affairs. I mean, there's so many people in LA County that need help, uh, various kinds of help. And, you know, we're here to do our best to try and offer assistance, but we are only human and there are only so many of us and we're all pedaling as fast as we can. But Unfortunately, we can't always get to everyone 
immediately. And that's frustrating to us as well, but it's just a fact of life, unfortunately. So um, we appreciate your patience and understanding that we are experiencing uh, an extreme demand for our services and for our help. And our 800 number is quite busy. Uh, so if, as Mary said, you don't wanna, wanna wait on hold, uh, you can schedule an appointment and get a one-on-one -on -one appointment with a counselor. Um, and um, that might be a workaround for that. Um, I'm also, um, Mike, I don't know if you're able um, to drop the phone appointment link in the chat. I don't have access uh, to send it to all participants. Um, I will send it over to you directly. And if we're able to drop that here, um, you'll have access to the direct, a direct link for our phone appointments. Hey, Mary, this is Hulisa. I also yes. um, put it in, been putting the phone number in the chat as well as the email and the link to the webpage, but I'll add this other one as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much. And I'll just add one quick reminder. I know it's been said before, but I want to let everyone know this presentation will be on the website um, up by tomorrow. So you can review all these materials as well. Um, again, we're getting some questions about allowable rent increases. Um, this particular question is asking about the 3% rent increase. They're in the city of LA. Uh, it's going to depend on what kind of property you're in, in the city of LA. Uh, if you're under the city's RSO, uh, then there is a rent freeze, as Mary mentioned, for the city that's in effect until 2024. Um, that's gonna be different than the county's allowable rent increases, which we mentioned will be 3% that goes into effect next month, April 1. But that's only for the unincorporated parts of LA County, not an incorporated city like city of LA, which has its own rules uh, as it applies to their rent stabilized units. Um, I'm also seeing some questions coming in about um, the department's rent registry system. So um, units subject to the county's rent stabilized ordinances um, do have a reg uh, re uh, registration requirement. Um, property owners are required to register properties annually and pay an annual registration fee. Um, some very uh, specific questions coming in related to that. Um, I do recommend either reaching out to our department or emailing our rent registry box. Um, and then what I will do is um, have um, our host drop the, the rent registry email box. But again, that will only be limited to rent registry related questions. Um, should you wanna forgo um, remaining on hold um, to, to reach a counselor. Okay, um, just another question on rent caps, uh, someone's asking about 10% versus 3%. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, if a property falls under the state rent control law, um, there is a rent cap under that law uh, that is capped currently at 10%. Uh, but if a property is in the unincorporated part of LA County and is a fully covered unit, uh, then that property is going to be limited to a 3% cap, not a 10% cap. So it depends on the type of property, how old it is, and where it's located. That's going to determine what the allowable rent increase uh, is and will be. And I think that's going to about wrap it up for Q&A. Um, there's still a lot of a lot of questions, but um, you know we tried to answer as many as we could. Uh, and as Mary said, you can reach out to us through a variety of um, ways, and uh, we'll certainly try and answer your specific questions.
And with that, uh, I'll again thank everyone for attending today, and uh, we hope that this information was helpful. Thank you, everyone.